In my talk this afternoon, I want to focus on informed consent for data sharing. Or put another way, the effect of data sharing on informed consent. And I'm going to focus on four of the issues that I think are most interesting in this area and give you a sense of the complexity or the interests that are going to be involved and need to be worked out. But first, I want to start with a sort of a flow chart to indicate where we are in the world of research with data and specimens under the common rule. So where we are is on the left-hand side. We're talking about primary research and, in fact, research with identifiable data going to an IRB and then requiring specific consent. And we're going to talk about what the elements of consent might be with regard to um, data sharing. I also want to point out that on the far right-hand side, you see the identified information. And under the heading of secondary research here, or actually it could be on the other side as well, if it's de-identified, as Kristen just mentioned, it's not subject to human, the human subjects rules, the common rule. Although there's a very interesting development that's taking place with regard to the data sharing policy, I want to follow up with that as my first main point. In the October 2020 um, notification of the final policy, NIH said, researchers should consider whether access to scientific data derived from humans, even if de-identified and lacking explicit limitations on subsequent use, should be controlled. And so what this means is that even though it's not going to be required putting controls on de-identified information, researchers should consider this. And I view the word consider as more than just considering and doing what is appropriate, even though it may not be legally mandated. Now, much of the literature dealing with de-identified data has focused on the first one on this list, and, and it was just discussed, in fact, that is the risk of re-identification, especially with genetic samples. In my view, um, that may be the most tantalizing issue now, but it's not the most important one. And there are others listed on the slide um, that I think may well be more important. And I want to talk about the second one. I don't have time to talk about all of them. And that is the issue of group harms. And the example I would use would be the Havasupai Indian tribe case that was settled in 2010. Uh, as most of you are familiar with the case, I just want to remind you that the harm that was suffered by the members of the Havasupai tribe did not relate to or depend on whether they were specific participants in the research that was being challenged. They were uh, concerned and uh, brought a lawsuit because um, information derived from DNA samples were used for studies on schizophrenia, inbreeding, and ancestral migration, which was extremely um, troublesome to the tribe members. And so group harms are very important uh, and should play a part in how we're dealing with the identified data, uh, as well as the other three that I mentioned, object objectionable uses, commercial exploitation, and undermining trust. The next topic is big data research. And um, this is also important. Big data, as you all know, is becoming increasingly important in uh, health research. And the best example of big data, I think, of course, is the NIH All of Us Research Project. And um, besides whole genome sequencing, the data sources for All of Us contain all four six all of those six categories that are on the slide. Um, some are pretty obvious as to why they are necessary, such as number four, um, electronic health records. Others are perhaps not as um, necessarily important or relevant to each kind of research, such as uh, geospatial data. But the essence of 
big data research is that because we don't know what is going to be valuable from a research perspective, uh, we ought to aggregate all available data and see if there's anything uh, that it shows. But even the six categories from all of us don't include all of the potential big data sources or the sources that are being used in precision medicine in all sorts of other contexts. And so I've listed eight other possible sources of data. Um, some of them are more easily accessible because they are publicly available, such as vital statistics of family members, which would include birth and death records, marriage and the like. And number eight, government records, which would include, for example, driver's license and voter registration, which are public matters. The others may or may not be available depending on the circumstances. The point I'm trying to make by reviewing all of this is individuals may well be concerned to learn that secondary research on their data may include all of these sources and that highly granular personal information may be studied by researchers. And if that is in fact the case, then I would ask the question of shouldn't that disclosure be part of the informed consent documents. Number three I wanna talk about is uh, what I call unregulated research, which I'm defining as research not subject to the common rule or FDA research regulations. They may be subject to other rules such as uh, the few states that have uh, laws dealing with the research within their jurisdiction. And here are listed on the slide, some of the kinds of unregulated researchers. Yesterday, you may recall that uh, speakers from NIH mentioned that it was one of the reasons why um, the data sharing policy was uh, put into place is to promote or to facilitate research by citizen scientists. Citizen scientists, of course, are not subject to the common rule. And now the question is, okay, um, why is there such a growth in research by unregulated researchers? And I think there are three reasons. Number one, especially in disease groups where you're talking about rare disorders, individuals who are affected or who have affected uh, children or relatives may be concerned that traditional research is too slow. It's not being responsive to their needs. Now in the last uh, 10 years, say it's so much easier through uh, crowdsourcing and social media to get groups of affected people together. They can share information, they can, they can raise money together, they can share data. And then there are publicly available data sources through direct to consumer genetic testing, phone, uh, uh, smartphone apps and all sorts of other areas where vast amounts of information can be used. So it can be uh, feasible in many cases for these unregulated researchers, non-traditional researchers to do this research. The unresolved question for NIH, I think, is should all researchers have access to shared data? Should it be open access or should it be some sort of registered access or restricted, limited access? If you're interested in this issue, I have to put in a plug for the um, special symposium that was published last year um, in 2020 through an NIH grant on unregulated health research and it has 21 articles and recommendations for NIH, FDA and other uh, agencies. So finally, um, number four on the list, if we're going to increase the amount of information that's gonna be in consents, is this gonna lead to consent bias? Um, and I think some researchers might assert that. I don't think that's true. I think consent bias only occurs when those who participate and those who don't participate are differentiated along a dimension that's measured by the research. Now, there are many reasons, including NIH funding requirements, why research needs to be representative of the population, but unrepresentativeness is not the same 
as bias. And even if there is, quote, bias, uh, common statistical methods such as inverse probability weighting can be used to account for that. So finally, my two uh, res uh, recommendations for NIH. Number one, um, I second the view of the NIH that um, consent requirements should be flexible. But the problem with flexibility is with so many people affected, we need to provide sort of guide rails for them. Uh, we need guidance, we need samples, uh, use cases and best practices from which individuals can uh, create informed consent documents and processes that are valuable. And then finally, uh, the challenge for all of us until at least 2023 and maybe beyond is how do we balance the need for disclosure to potential participants so that they can make informed decisions whether to participate or not with concerns that we not provide them with so much information that they're overloaded, they can't um, comprehend what's being asked of them, and in fact may um, be discouraging participation because it's too much for them to think about. So those are some things for all of us to think about. And I, I thank you for inviting me.